And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host and author, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome back one of my very favorite authors and people for the seventh time I've lost count, the incredible <laughs> New York Times bestselling author, Lisa Unger, here to give us the inside scoop and spill all the tea on the couple in 5B. Lisa Unger, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me. So The New Couple in 5B is about a young couple, Chad and Rosie. So Rosie is a true crime writer and Chad is an actor and their luck has been like all bad. You know, <laughs> they are struggling to make ends meet and they're like trying to have a family and it's not going very well. And then they receive a surprise inheritance of a dream apartment in an iconic New York City building. And they're thrilled to move in um, but of course, as soon as they do, sort of some dark and strange things start to happen. And Rosie has to dig into the secrets of the Windermere uh, before she too falls under its spell. So that is the setup for the new couple in 5B. Oh my goodness. Well, I am so excited to chat all of the things because as per like all Lisa Unger books, I devoured this one and I have so many questions. So I can't wait to d dive into every delicious detail. But before we get started, I just want to welcome everyone. We are broadcasting live to seven different destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So hey, mystery and thriller loving friends, no matter where you're watching from, you're in the right place. This is the right time. It is Mystery Monday. And because Mondays can be murder, we're going to make it a little less painful for you and get your week off to a killer start. So wow. if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, welcome, friends. Um, here's the drill. Every Monday, I give you my handpicked featured authors, and you get to ask them anything. So ask the incredible New York Times bestselling Lisa Unger anything you want to know about this book, her past books, her writing process, secrets, her deep, dark secrets. We know you got a few, Lisa. We're going to spill them yeah. all yes, here on Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Uh, Randy's joining us from YouTube. He says, greetings from Indiana. Hi, Randy. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Renee is joining us from uh, Facebook. She says, hi, Lisa and Sarah from Southeast Florida. Your fellow Floridian there. Very Yay. nice. Ooh, we have uh, oh a mystery user who's revealing her identity. She says, hi, ladies. I'm so excited to be here with you. Hi, Wendy. Welcome. So Robin cool. is joining us from Facebook. She says, hello, Sarah and Lisa. Hi, Robin. Such a pleasure to see you pop up. Welcome. Um, oh, we have a, a couple other mystery users, very on brand here for Mystery and Thriller Maven, saying, hi, friends. <laughs> oh, someone's here for the puns. Hi, friends. <laughs> we have John joining us from Northeast Ohio. Hi, John. Mm -hmm. um, good. Hello. Renee says, this book sounds so good. I pre-ordered your book, Lisa, and I can't wait to receive it and read it. I hope to see you in Fort Lauderdale, too. Yeah, I think, well, am I coming to Fort Lauderdale? I'm coming to the Broward County Library um, Feast, the Literary Feast. So I think that's pretty close to Fort Lauderdale. Yay. Okay, perfect. Um, so Lisa, let's talk about this book because first of all, there's just so there's so there's so much to talk about here, right? There is a true crime writer. Where's all my true crime fans out there? reporting for duty, me and all of us, right? We okay. have a fabulous, I mean, it starts out with a dream inheritance. Who doesn't want to inherit a gorgeous two-bedroom yeah. sunsplash pre-war apartment on in Mary no. Hill in New York City? So glamorous, except dun-dun-dun. It <laughs> isn't. <laughs> So um, anyone else also devouring only murders in the building? Um, so, so, I love that show. so I Lisa, how did you come up with this idea? Yeah, it's interesting. There's usually like, for me, there's usually like one thing, there's like a seed or a germ, and it leads me to like a lot of research. Um, and then the best way I can explain it is if it's something like, you know, connects with something deeper that's going on within me, then I maybe will start to hear a voice or voices. Um, and those are the voices that I follow through the manuscript. And so this is a, like a little bit more layered than that. Um, I, so the apartment in the new couple in 5B is actually based upon a real apartment. My aunt, when I was a kid, she owned an apartment in a building like this. And I, as a, as a young person, I just thought it was like 
the most glamorous life. Like she worked in fashion and, you know, she was like very, very chic. And so she had this apartment and we would spend a lot of time in this like, you know, beautiful place visiting with her. And, um, but she was like, you know, a complicated person. And so those visits were always sort of layered. And um, I kind of brought that piece forward. So when, and I've, you know, I, I lived in New York City for a long time and I still spend a lot of time there. So it's always like, there's a New York City that like kind of just belongs to me. It's like a P it's like partially from my childhood. It's partially from my time there as a young student and then a young professional. And then now when I go back, it's different again. So there was just something about that relationship to the city and that particular apartment that like sort of, sort of was like part of the seed for this book. And then um, a couple of years ago, I had occasion to uh, reread Rosemary's Baby by Ira, the great Ira Levin. Um, and there were just some pieces of that too, that really kind of resonated with me at the time. Like the idea of like trying to like build a life in a place that's toxic and a place that's like working against you. And so there was that piece that I kind of wanted to, you know, explore a little bit as well. So yeah, it was like kind of a combination of those two things that led me to start hearing Rosie's voice. Ah. <sighs> Oh my gosh, is Rosie after Rosemary's baby? Rosemary? I mean, maybe it's like I don't it wasn't it wasn't chosen. It's just her name. So, <gasps> yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, like oh, wow. my character names just sort of are just there. Like I don't make their names up. They they come with their names, so probably on some level, yes. Oh my goodness, we're unraveling the mysteries of Lisa Unger. That's right. As, <laughs> as that Lisa. is a lot. Oh my god, there's a this is a lot. Okay. I've never I have never read a Rosemary's Baby. So we we have a lot more to unravel. A lot more you, to I will just say that if anybody listening, if you have not read Ira Levin, um, you really need to read him because even now, many, many years later, his work stands up completely. It's, he's one of the, you know, he's a, a, just a great American writer. So if you haven't read Ira Levin, I suggest, you know, after you buy the new couple in 5B. <laughs> After you buy the new couple in five B, way after that. <laughs> you go on and you go on an IR eleven deep dive. Yeah, I've never I've never read IR eleven. I must live under a rock, but I will get to work on that right after I get to this. Um, Renee wants to know while writing this book, which we now know was uh, first inspired by your real life aunt's real life apartment in New York City. Did you feel closer to your aunt's? I did. That's a really interesting question Ooh. because the place, you know, so places always figure very prominently in my work. There's, you know, houses and apartments and stuff. And, and for me, it's like, there are these iconic places in my life that mm. like, I just, the memories of those places are so um, just close. Right. So my grandmother mm -hmm. lived in Bay Ridge, you know, her entire life, you know, she died when she was a hundred years old. She lived in the same neighborhood, you know, from the time she was a kid and, you know, until the end of her life. And so her place, her, like her row house in Bay Ridge is like, I mean, I remember every single detail of that place. And I don't know, I'm, I'm not even sure why, you know, but like, it's just so, there are other places that had greater significance in my life, but that place, I just remember every single detail. And when I think about her, she's linked to that place. The same is true of this, this Park Avenue apartment where my aunt lived, where there was, you know, an elevator man. And, you know, it was like this, you know, I remember every single piece of that apartment. And in fact, when she passed, she, she had moved from that apartment into another into another one. Um, but my mom, um, asked me if I, if I wanted anything from her apartment and I thought, Oh no, I don't think so. You know, I don't, I don't need anything. I didn't, you know, think I wanted anything, but my mom, um, wound up, uh, taking some things for me, a little crystal hedgehog. Um, <laughs> and these, these prints, these fashion drawings, um, that she, that, a that a designer had given her and that she had framed. And so she gave me those things and I was so glad to have them because, you know, when I think, of, when I see them, I think of her and I think of, you know, and, and, and while writing the, the apartment, I really felt, you know, I, those memories were very present for me. 
Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, oh, we have one of the Mr. YouTubers saying, my name isn't coming up, but it's me, Robin. That is, of course, Robin Bonavita. She is Robin underscore reads. Um, oh, one. And she's a bookstagrammer, and she is currently reading and reviewing The New Couple in 5B. Awesome. So here's a link to Robin Bonavita, Robin Reads, and her latest book pick um, of – uh, Lisa's book, and if memory serves, she just returned from vacation, and and you, your book kept her That's away right. from her kids. She I got her in trouble with her family. family. I'm so sorry, but not really. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it so much that you couldn't stop reading. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, Robin says, did you dedicate this book to your... Actually, you dedicated it to your uncle. Tell us about your uncle. I dedicated it to um, my... I, I Actually, I think I dedicated to all three of them. To all um, three of us. My Aunt Phyllis, um, my Uncle Mario, who was you know a wonderful man um, and who also passed away in the last few years, and my Uncle Freddie, who also more recently passed away. So... You know, my mother, Uncle Freddie was my mother's brother. And then uh, Mario and Phyllis was also my mom's, was my mom's sister. And Mario was my dad's brother. And so, um, I, you know, but they were all very important, formative figures in my life. And so, you know, they're still very present with me. So I was happy to donate the, uh, dedicate the book to them. I love that. I love it. I especially thought your uncle sounded like a very interesting and fabulous person. Yes. Yes. They, they all, they all were, they're all very big, very big personalities with, you know, and lots of, you know, good memories of them all. Yay. And we have someone saying hi from Minnesota. Hi. Welcome hi. to the conversation. Um, everybody, Lisa is coming on before this book is even out to give us the inside scoop to spill the tea on the new couple in 5B, as the cool kids say, and right. to take all of your most pressing questions. So the book is not even out. She's just here to give us the inside scoop, mystery and thriller maven style, and take our questions. So um, we want to pre-order from our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore. That is, of course, Murder by the Book. So whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, here is that link to pre-order tonight. And the good folks at Murder by the Book will ship that out to you the day that the book drops right around the corner. <laughs> So um, here is that link. So click and pre-order so that you can immerse yourself in the world in the world of the Windermere and Rosie, the true crime writer, and um, and her husband uh, Chad, and also flashbacks from I, from a mysterious character named Willa. So we have a lot to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we do. We have a lot to talk about. Um, uh, okay, so first I want to get to um, some of this amazing praise that your um, that your book has earned. Kicking off with um, Sarah Michelle Geller, who no. was posting pictures of your book in her beach bag, which was the coolest thing ever. And she says, Lisa Unger, you've done it again. <laughs> Lisa, tell us every single detail about this whole thing. Oh my God. Sarah Michelle Geller is like amazing. She's like just an amazing human. Um, she actually, she wrote um, about one of my books or she mentioned it in an interview. Like this was a few years ago. And I, um, I, I was, you know, I, I saw the, the, you know, the little piece that she had written about it, how and said, she said that she was a fan so I went on Instagram and I I followed her and I wrote her a note. But of course, you know, she didn't follow me. So <laughs> the, the note that I that I sent like wound up, you know, I was sure it would just wind up in her junk box and that she would never see it. But she eventually did see it. And I had written to say, thank you so much. Can I send you a signed copy? And she said, oh my God, yes, please. I would love a signed copy. So I sent her a signed copy. And so every year... I send her a copy of the book. I write to her and say, Hey, do you still want a copy? And she does. So she, so I sent her a copy of the new couple in 5B as I do pretty much every year. And she was just kind enough to, um, to mention it in her, uh, in her vacation, in her vacation pics, which oh. was incredibly cool because, you know, I mean, obviously I'm a child of the eighties. Yeah. So like Buffy, hello. <laughs> Yes. Oh my Cruel God. Intentions. Hello. I mean, oh. it's all. Oh my God. Yes. So when Buffy the Vampire Slayer puts you 
in her beach bag and takes your book to the beach. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's just like, I mean, I, I mean, it's amazing. It's like a mind blow. I mean, it's a complete yeah. like geeked out moment. So yeah, very super, super exciting for sure. Oh my God. It's so exciting. Sharon, welcome to the conversation saying I'm so, I'm always so excited when you have new books out, Lisa. Thank you, Sharon. Yay. Yay. You are an auto buy, auto read for me as well, Lisa, and for so many of us here. So we are so excited to chat. Uh, Robin says, worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> totally agree. Um, so Lisa and someone had a question back here uh, asking, do you believe, oh, it's from Renee. Do you believe in ghosts or spirits? You know, I kind of do, but only in this really Jungian way, you know, I, <laughs> I kind of think that there are way more questions than there are answers you know, about the universe. And I've had some interesting experiences in my life that make me, you know, sort of wonder a lot about, you know, the other side, the, the, you know, the sort of spiritual side. And I think that there's like a psycho spiritual component to our existence that, you know, Carl Jung was very interested in exploring, you know, Carl Jung, his mother was a medium and, you know, he was very, very curious about the, the spiritual world. And this was in fact, like one of the big places where Freud and Jung broke from each other because Freud was all about, you know, just the here and now, the physical, the real world. But, you know, Jung believed that there was, you know, a, a lot more to us and to our brains and to our minds than could be explained by, you know, science as we know it. So, yeah, I do think that there are a lot of questions and I'm, you know, wide open to what those answers might be. Have you ever seen a ghost or a spirit, Lisa? I, I think I have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to need all of the deets. <laughs> okay. So I was a kid and I was living in the UK and I spent the night at a friend's house and she lived in this really, really old house. Uh, it lived in, it was in a town outside of London called Kingston on Thames. And she had a very old house that she lived in with her family. And I got up to go to the bathroom and her, the, there was this, there was another bedroom that was her brother's bedroom, but her brother was off to college. So the bedroom was empty. When I came back from the bathroom, there was a green light in the bedroom. So of course, you know, I had to go see what, what it was because that's uh, the kind of person I've always been. <laughs> Some of so, them would not. I, was, yeah, I mean, I was little, I mean, I must've been like, I don't know, maybe 10. So I went in and I saw sitting on the bed, a, a man who was gl glowing green. He had a, you know, sort of a, a suit and a hat and a cane and he was sitting on the bed and he was emanating a green light and but, I didn't feel scared or threatened or anything, but I definitely did just leave <laughs> and go back to bed. Wait, you could get back to sleep after that? Yeah, I just was like not threatened by it. It just seemed like, okay, there was some, somebody in that room and it was weird and I wasn't scared. And that's all I remember from this child, <laughs> this childhood memory. So maybe I was hallucinating, but I don't think so. I mean, it we, stayed with me all my life. He was a full person. Well, in person, like not just yeah. a floating head or a floating yeah. torso, like a whole. Yeah, like a whole person. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, I Renee, so, wow. I didn't, find, I didn't find out who it was. I did not. In fact, you know, maybe I need to go <laughs> Maybe I should go find that house again. I mean, it's still there. Did you ever tell your cousin? My friend? No, I, I never told anyone. I never told okay. anyone. Until oh now. And this is the first time you're telling everyone? Oh, my God. I, mean, I may have told it one other time when somebody asked me if I believed in ghosts. But I I kind of do. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> you'd have to after you saw the green glowing man. So he just was right. sitting there just doing he was nothing. Just sitting there. He was just sitting there. Wow. Okay. I okay. Mean, it felt very benevolent. Like it didn't feel like it, it wasn't a green person. <laughs> 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 oh 
<laughs> he was a green person. He wasn't a green person. He was just emanating green light. How, but he was skin toned. But no, he was green. No, he was. He was green. It was green. He was a green person. Oh my god. Okay. Oh my <laughs> I was. God. I don't know how much further we can dig into this childhood memory. You, you need, need to find to... out who he was. She's right. I do. You know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure you it have... out. You got to figure it out. You have to go back to the house and find out who owned that house, who died in that house. Okay. Who I'm going to do was it. The green man. Yeah, you have I'm to go do it. I'm serious. Oh I am. I'm going to do it. I'm serious. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. Okay. And then report back. Oh my God. That could be your next book. Absolutely. I'll report back. Next time we do this, I will, I will have found out who it was. Oh I'm my God. Sharon, Sharon saying a new book idea. Exactly. <laughs> and then remember everybody, you saw it first on Mystery and Thriller Mavis. This happened right. on Mystery and Thriller Mavis. The and thriller then writer who goes back <laughs> to a childhood house to explore a memory that she doesn't understand. Saw a glowing green man. Yeah. sitting on a bed and then yeah and then and then this is the start of your next book oh my god i'm so excited all right, all right. it's robin it's saying on. we had a sweet older lady who lived in our home many years before us three or four of us felt or and or saw her yeah i believe wow. that okay okay i believe it i mean like i don't know that i necessarily believe that it's the only you know like that we pass and that we're ghosts. Like, I don't necessarily think that they're, that's the only, but I think it might have something more to do with like quantum physics than actual like spirits, like wow. trapped and like trapped energy. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. You know, this could um, go real. This could go very deep. It could go, this could very, go very deep. deep. Yeah. Um, Sharon <laughs> saying mark down today's date. So we all remember being here. Yes. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Renee saying, Absolutely. I can't wait to hear who he was and why you saw him. I mean, right, I why I saw him. Yeah, you exactly. Definitely, okay. You definitely saw him. Robin saying, her ghost was a nice lady. Okay, this is good. Yeah. So sometimes they're nice. The green I think, man, I think probably most often they're nice, right? Like people. I don't know. <laughs> most don't often know. people are nice. Some, there's a few bad eggs, but maybe it's okay. Oh my God. Okay. I love this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to start coughing now. I'm just getting over a cold. So hold on. Or maybe it's the glowing green man. We don't know. Um, I not say any more about him. <laughs> we have so many people who get, who weighed in with weighed, with words of praise. Jocelyn, Jocelyn Jackson, New York Times bestselling author of With oh, My God. Little Eye, raving, the tension just keeps building in Unger's latest dark and twisty delight. Come for the gonzo plot, but stay to be haunted by a history-soaked old New York apartment building that feels more, feels more like a sinister character than a setting. And for bright, ambitious, clear-eyed Rosie, whose voice stuck with me long after I turned the final page. I loved it. And you will too. Congratulations on that rave review from Jocelyn Jackson. And she is not the only one weighing in. We have Greg Hurwitz, New York Times bestselling author of oh, Lone you. Wolf. And he had some incredible words of praise too. I'm going to pop this all up so we can see it together. He says, Lisa Unger writes with the totality of her heart. I loved that because it's so true, Lisa. That's you. Oh. Thank and you. her wickedness. The new couple in 5B has has both on glorious. He knows display. me well. He Greg knows me very well. <laughs> Who else could artfully marry a nail-biting domestic suspense with a ghostly edge worthy of Du Maurier? This one mm. screams. I had I read it in a single sitting. Congratulations, Lisa. Just Thank wow. This is, it's so cool to see your work celebrated and received by so many incredible writers. Claire McIntosh raving about the incredible setting that you that you um, wrote about calling this the perfect creepy setting for this superb psychological thriller, which is beautifully crafted and deliciously unsettling. I couldn't turn the pages fast enough. Oh, Lisa, okay. it just, it's so cool to see these, to see all of this, uh, all of these incredible authors celebrating you. Um, and now friends, you can pre-order tonight from our favorite woman owned independent bookstore. That is of course, Murder by the Book. So whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube here, oh, thanks for all the hearts, you guys. Here yeah. is the link and you too can pre-order the, the new couple in 5B. Um, Lisa, we had some questions submitted in advance. This one from Brian Larrabee. He wants to know, do you plot, do you pants? Can you give us a peek into your process? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I do not plot at all. I am, if I, if I had an outline for the book, I wouldn't be able to write it because I write for the same reason that I read because I want to know what's going to happen. Um, and I, um, I, I don't love the term panther, you know, cause I kind of think of it more as like a gardener, you know, you plant a seed and then like you kind of watch it grow and you give it light and air and you trim and, you know, take care of it and stuff. And then the next thing you know, there is a novel. And I don't actually think that the processes are so different, like the outliner and people who write the way I write. I just think it takes me longer to write my outline and it's a book when it's done, <laughs> not an outline. So I, um, that's pretty much how I, that's pretty much how I do a planter. That's great. I love it. <laughs> You're a planter. That is perfect. Thank you so much. That is so good. A planter. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how I do it. But I've oh, I've always written that way. You know, for me, it's like just about you know I have an essence. I have an idea. I have like kind of a like a loose sort of maybe feeling about what the book is kind of going to be about. But you know, it's really about you know inhabiting character and um, plot flowing from character. I love that. I love that. How long does it take you to write a book, Lisa? My first draft usually takes about nine, um, nine to 12 months. And then of course there's, you know, another year of editing and proofreading and copy editing and all of that. So yeah, but the first draft usually takes about nine to 12 months. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's take this question. Um, from, Renee says that sounds perfect. Absolutely. Um, let's take this question from Amanda. She's wondering about any advice you have for aspiring authors. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, we get this question a lot. And I honestly think the, the most important advice I can give you is just to find your space to write. You know, like, I think that there's not a lot of permission in our culture for the unpublished writer, you know, like there's always like a million other things that you should be doing or that you need to be doing. You have other responsibilities like a job and a family and maybe your partner is not, you know, um, very supportive of that dream, you know, cause it's not making any money. Like that's how we really, you know, that's how we quantify things in our culture. But like, I think if you have the desire to write, like if you have a story that you want to tell and you have a desire to write that you owe it to yourself to own that, you know, and if you own it and you, and it means something to you, then you have to schedule the time to do it the same way that you would schedule anything else that was important to you. Like if you wanted to get in shape, you would say, okay, I'm going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you'd get yourself a personal trainer and you'd make an appointment and you'd keep that appointment. Right. So if this is something that you really want to do, then you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the work to schedule the time and honor the schedule. And it doesn't have to be that much time. Even if you're lucky enough to have a couple hours on a weekend, or if you can get up an hour early in the morning, just so that you are honoring that dream um, and that you're touching and working on your manuscript often, as often as you can, you'd be surprised how, how quickly a novel can develop when you're actually dedicating the time to do it. So that's my best advice. Just write, make sure you set the time and, and do it. I love that. And I, there's uh, <laughs> there's so many poignant, uh, wonderful moments in this book. But one I especially loved is when Rosie's early on meeting with her um, editor, Max, and she, yeah. of course, was hoping that he will say, I love it. It's perfect. And he says, there's a lot to like. And then her <laughs> interior monologue says, which means he didn't like it at all. And then she goes on to say, writers only want to be told that our work is loved. And I was like, it it, it was so poignant. I was like, ah, this hits right here in my heart. Robin yeah. wants to know, has technology helped with streamlining your publishing process or complicated it further? No, oh, that's such an interesting question because, well, I mean, in terms of publishing, you know, publishing still kind of remains a, uh, like an old school business. I mean, it still kind of seems that way to me. I mean, it's only just a few, it's only been like a few years since we like sort of moved away from paper manuscripts. Like you used to get like the big paper manuscript in the, in the mail and it had all, all the sticky notes on it. Right. And, 
And there was something like very tactile and satisfying about that. But now everything is electronic. You know, you get an electronic document and the track changes, which is a program that allows you to kind of your editor to make notes in the margin and for you to electronically deal with it. And same with your copy editing. So I think in that way, like maybe it streamlined the process a little bit. Um, and it is certainly easier, I think, to work that way. Like, you know, but there's something less peaceful about it. You know, I always felt very like, you know, sort of like when you have that manuscript and you have those handwritten notes, there's like, I still, I still keep, I keep all of that stuff. So I still have those with my like notes in the margin from the, from the editor. So in that way, I think, you know, it's, de it's definitely like maybe a little bit faster. You're not like boxing up a manuscript and sending it FedEx to your editor anymore. Um, so <laughs> Which it wasn't that long ago that, you know, we were doing that stuff, you know, and, um, and I think in terms of like, you know, just social media and stuff like this, I mean, like, I mean, this is like, you know, this wasn't even possible, you know, five or, or 10 years ago mm. to have this kind of gathering, you know, virtual gathering, which I think is something that, you know, really blossomed during the pandemic. Um, and I think it's, it has stayed around because, there are plenty of people that, you know, just have never been able to get out to a book signing. You know, they've never been able to come see me. Like I have a physical limitation of how many cities I can go to. And it's like, you know, people, there are plenty of people who, for whatever reason, whether it's you're caring for children or an elderly parent, or there's some, some type of physical challenge that you can't get out of the house to be able to connect with people who can, you know, come to the store and say hi is a real gift and a blessing. So I think that there's, you know, a, a lot of a lot of layers to technology, but in those ways it's been it's been positive. It that is so true. It is so true, Lisa, and I think about that all the time. Yeah. Um, Kim wants to know, welcome to the conversation. She wants to know how many words do you write every day? Yeah, I'm not like a word counter. I know people do that. And like some people feel really like sort of, you know, happy when they've achieved their word count. But like, I don't really think of my book in terms of those units exactly. I mean, I, I probably, you know, probably a minimum of a thousand words a day, but sometimes it's much more than that. So it just depends. Like, you know, I always feel like, you know, there are these ebb days and they're our flow day is like any organic process. You know, you have these days where you just can't stop the work from coming. You can't stop the words and you're just in the zone. And then you have days where you're just kind of like, okay, so <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? Have I ever written a book before? Do I even know how to write a book? Like, you know, you have those days where you're not connecting with the story or whatever it is. And like, I don't just like, there are some writers that are like, I'm going to put down a thousand words, no matter what I can fix it later. I don't feel that way. Like yeah. I don't, I don't do that. So if I'm having trouble finding the next space or I can't hear my character's voice, I'm going to get up and do something else. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to, you know, like there are things you can do. You can, you can work out, you can throw the ball for your dog. You can go for a walk. You can bake a cake you can do the laundry, you cannot get on Facebook or Instagram or answer any emails. Like you can't do that because that takes you out of the creative brain and into the work brain, like the business brain. You don't, don't want to be there. And so you can do things that kind of like will jog loose the creative or like let you be blank enough that you can find that next foothold um, and, or hear that next voice or whatever it is. So that's kind of more my process than like an actual word count. Thank you for that insight, Lisa. And I totally agree. It's, I think that's because we're both yogis, right? Like we're not going to force it. We're going to ebb on the ebb days and we're going to flow on the flow days and it's all going to even out in the end. There's no need to force it. You can absolutely you can literally go with the flow. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Cause we're actually over time, but we're having so much fun. Renee wants to know what kind of, what books are you currently reading? Oh, I actually, so I have my little stack here. I like, so I was really excited today that I got um, this book by Sarah Pierce, mm -hmm. The Wild. Mm -hmm. This is an early, early read. I'm a big fan of Sarah Pierce and um, I'm excited to read this. So this came today. So that's exciting. Yay. And then also, I'm always reading like multiple, <laughs> multiple books. 
Oh, Greg Hermans. Yes. You know, okay. I have to say about Greg that um, the orphan. I've. I'm, I'm a. Greg is my my friend, my co president, but I'm also a devoted fan of his work. I don't think there's anybody writing thrillers like Greg. I mean, he has just really got like this very unique style of like just being a super beautiful, intelligent, um, wonderful writer, and also like great tech, amazing action, super layered character. So I always look forward to my, uh, my orphan X book. And I, I was telling him today, like, I'm literally only allowing myself like one chapter at a time because otherwise it's over. And then there's I no love more. that. That's a sign of a good book where you're like, I want it to last. So I'm only going to, I'm going to portion it out and only. Well, yeah, have <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, so those are two, two, two on my on my uh, my pile right now. Oh, those are some good. Those are some good books to have in a pile. Yeah. Um, Robin saying, I'm so thankful for this technology that allows authors and readers together, especially during COVID and especially during yes. our move to a new state where I am in an extreme minority politically. So I'm not out making new friends. Oh, Robin, thank Hello. you. We're, we're your people. We're, we're here. Your people we're your people here. <laughs> yes, and we're so happy to have you here with us. You guys, the book is available for pre-order. So get your fingers clicking uh, to pre-order. And the good folks at Murder by the Book, our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore, will send it to you the morning the book drops. So here is that link. Um, Lisa Unger, thank you so much for coming on to give us the inside scoop on the new couple in 5B. Um, and we can't wait to get more, get more Unger, get more, get our hands on some more Unger. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Sarah, for having me. I love being here with you all. Oh, we love having you. All right, y'all. That's a wrap for us. We'll be back at the top of the hour with Mark Greening. Go get yourself a snack, a drink, and get back here. I'll see you soon.